Yeah. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's a rainy day. I like rainy days when I have a presentation because it, um, um, I, I get more audience. Um, and hopefully um, you'll enjoy uh, today's presentation. We will be talking about um, art on ancient coins and coins as artworks. Uh, one of my um, uh, favorite topics um, I became interested in this topic many, many years ago when my wife uh, decided to go back to university um, after a career in um, accounting. She decided to be a sculpt, or she decided to study um, sculpting. And um, she went to university um, uh, during late 1990s. And then she would come home and um, tell me about what they discussed about art history and how certain uh, art movement started after the um, Renaissance or how this art form was first introduced during 1700s or that art form was introduced during um, 1800s. And I looked at her in quite perplexed um, mind. Uh, are you sure that your professors know what they're talking about? And she says, well, you know, these are books, you know, uh, published books by um, famous art historians and this and that. I said, well, I'm afraid they are gravely mistaken uh, about their assertions. And then uh, the idea came that um, I um, do a presentation for the, um, for the art department. And I took some um, um, slight photos at that time we didn't have the internet or we did have computers and internet but not not so widespread so I took some um, slight photos and um, made a presentation to um, the uh, art department and you had to see the, um, the the reaction everyone was just perplexed wow we didn't know that you know art um, forms were actually introduced many, many thousands uh, of years ago. So this is um, a, a product of uh, that introduction. Um, but I have always been interested in, um, in art myself. And um, later on, I'm going to show you some slides and, and, and you will see why I appreciate this topic so much. Um, Let's start this, and I always ask this question. I know it's a controversial question. Uh, what is art? Because art is pursued differently um, depending on um, the person. You know, every one of us um, has a way of to look at things. And even if we say, I know nothing about art, we are judgmental when we see something. We always judge things uh, when we look at them. I'll go back to my um, um, first um, slide here. So I'm going to move things to different places and, and I'll just ask you to look at this and, and decide as to what you feel about this. So if I didn't organize this page in a presentable way, you will not say anything. You'll look at it you will say, hmm. you will not give me a thumb up. Even though you don't say anything, you will not give me a thumb up. It's, it's obvious that I didn't do a good job. Art is something like that. Art has to be presentable. It has to be such that when you look at it without knowing anything about art, you should be able to feel good about it. You will not comment about it, but you will feel good about it. And then it is accepted art. Um, and now from an artist's perspective, do I have to make acceptable art? Of course, the um, discussion um, has continued for centuries and it will never end. Um, public art. We see a lot of examples of public art in daily life and wherever we go, uh, regardless of the country that we live uh, or area that we live, we see public art. Again, the perception of uh, uh, the people and artists and the supporters of those artists determine uh, what is a public art uh, piece or um, what is not. 
So on the left-hand side, I have the Nike of Samothrace from the third century BC, Hellenistic period. And on the right-hand side, um, a rather modern um, art um, sculpture, um, sculpture um, in, in Vancouver. Um, so the perception is that um, a painting may be a pure art, while a chair, though designed to be set in, may include artistic elements. Yet, we know that uh, in modern uh, art museums, we see chairs simply set on a pedestal as uh, a piece of um, artwork. And who determines what is art? That's really curious. Um, the price of the, uh, the, the chair that is set uh, on a pedestal in that museum, $2 million or $500,000, is that the one that constitutes uh, the art conception? That's, you know, these are all um, open to um, discussion topics. So art is basically stimulating the human senses, mind and or spirit in any way. Whenever we feel um, influenced by looking at something, we can consider it um, a piece of art or not. And, and, and fine art in our modern perception is less functional value or intention. And when an object um, has a functional, um, um, a functional uh, property, then we call it um, a craft, a piece of craft. Is it really true? And or how did ancient people look at, uh, look at these? So again, um, when you uh, go online and, um, and, and uh, research the, um, this, the statue of um, Nike from Samoth Race, um, you will read astonishing things. Um, some of the researchers try to um, connect it to uh, the Actium War. The others um, talk about uh, Demetrius, Demetrius's um, victory over the um, um, Ptolemies uh, in 306 BC, uh, and, and, and some others try to connect it uh, to other historical events. Yet, this uh, sculpture was found on a tiny island in the North Aegean Sea, just a small, tiny island here. Uh, and, you know, how do you connect it to so many uh, famous historical happenings. It is despising the people of Samothrace. Uh, you're simply saying, uh, if it were not that famous happening, uh, famous war or victory, uh, Samothrace people um, didn't or wouldn't be able to come up with an idea like this, which is unacceptable. There are so many sort of typical interpretation um, about art is that we have to look at it more carefully. And we should not believe in everything that we read or hear. And, and we need to um, put a perspective on top of it. And some of those people um, with five-star degrees in archeology span or history didn't know that there was a coin probably struck um, on that island that was inspired by this um, statue. Um, this is a tetradrum of uh, Demetrius uh, Poliarchetes, uh, the besieger. Um, and, and it might not have anything to do with his uh, victory or the uh, Ptolemaic navy off the coast of Cyprus. Uh, this guy was a famous um, navy um, general um, helping his father, uh, Antigonus I of Ptolemus. So he was simply advertising his Navy career. Uh, it might not have anything to do with his victory because right uh, after that victory in uh, 306 BC, he besieged the, um, uh, the city of Rhodes and it was a huge failure. He lost uh, a lot of money and, and equipment and there was nothing for him to brag about. Um, and, and his victory over the uh, Ptolemaic Navy might not mean anything. 
Yet the people of Samothrace thought and needed uh, a piece of artwork um, in, in, in the Agora maybe, you know, or in, um, in an open uh, area, and they appreciated art, the people appreciated art, and they created a piece of art, not necessarily to advertise um, the victory of uh, Demetrius Polyarchetes. And also we have to consider the, the size of the island. It's just a small island. Uh, in modern times, its population is not any more than three, four, or 5,000 people. Why would you advertise your victory if it were um, such a huge victory uh, on a small island, right? So, you know, we should be careful when we uh, read um, dissertations uh, or, or theories about certain artworks. Uh, I think most of the time researchers try to aggrandize their own work and uh, they make some false assertions uh, about uh, the artwork uh, just to make their study look larger. Not really, um, actually, the uh, object itself is so large, yet for the people of Samatres, this object was extremely important. And there was an artist or a group of artists, and they were skillful enough, and they were ambitious enough, and they had support uh, for such an piece of art, uh, public art, could be um, constructed. So again, going back um, to modern perception, um, uh, art and craft uh, are two separate fields in our minds in modern times, uh, because uh, we developed a certain sense of art and whatever we don't do, a, a certain person does, and it is recognized by certain authorities, whoever they might be, it is called art. And now I have three examples um, of um, objects from different times, and they're all considered art. But when we look at the ancient pieces, were they considered art um, at the time that they were created? That's a very interesting question. And here is um, a piece of public art. Um, I really appreciate it, the one on the left-hand side. Um, it, it was a um, gum post uh, bust uh, put right next to the art gallery in Vancouver, downtown Vancouver, a couple of years ago. And it developed so interestingly. I appreciated it. It's, it's uh, inspiring. Uh, however, you cannot compare uh, that uh, with the other one, the, uh, the Apollo uh, on the, on the right-hand side. So the perception is, my perception is, and, and the perception of others will vary dramatically when we look at a piece of um, art. And then, of course, the value of art becomes uh, an issue for us to um, deal with. Um, Card Players by um, Paul Cezanne um, was sold in 2011 for more than $250 million. So who determines the value of um, this painting? Uh, Paul Cezanne uh, didn't have a bad life, but didn't have an incredible life either. I mean, wealthy life either. And um, yes, he created um, art and he was a prolific uh, painter. Um, I'm sure he would be completely appalled uh, had he seen uh, one of his uh, paintings um, was sold for $250 million. And then, of course, we look at a statue um, from the Roman period, first century AD, um, the statue of um, um, Augustus. And then um, I, I read uh, Lucian, uh, from Samosat uh, uh, about uh, sculpture's life. This is really interesting. If you become a stone cutter, you will be nothing more than a workman doing hard physical labor. You will be obscure, earning a small wage, a man of low esteem, classed as worthless by public opinion, neither courted by friends, feared by enemies, nor envied by your fellow citizens, 
but just a common workman, a craftsman, a face in a crowd, one who makes his living with his hands. So this is um, in the second century AD. This is how um, a historian looks at an artist or a craftsman as he calls it. Yeah. And then uh, we have glorious examples of um, sculptural work in, uh, in history. We don't know anything, um, well, nothing uh, touchable um, has been left to our time, but Phidias's uh, Zeus um, at Olympia was a glorious um, statue. And, and then we hear uh, Polycletus created this incredible um, Hera uh, statue, uh, which the, the head survived. Uh, so at least we know that um, it was really uh, made by Polycletus if, of course, um, the archaeological information is correct, because this statue is very similar to many other statues uh, from the 5th century BC. And whatever says that this was uh, made by Polycletus, I really would like to know, but I don't know. Yet, I look at uh, Plutarchus, and um, in the uh, life of Pericles, this is what he says about artists or um, Craftsman. It does not necessarily follow that if a work is delightful because of its gracefulness, the man who made it is worthy of our serious regard. No one, no gifted young man upon seeing the Zeus of Phidias at Olympia or the hero of Polycletus at Argos ever actually wanted to be Phidias or Polycletus. So he simply says they were not role models. They were just low level people. And he goes on to say, no matter how useful or how beautiful the object, how essential to the physical or spiritual needs of the individual or community for whom it was made, be it hunting knife, defense tower, or gold and ivory cut statue, the maker was in no way admirable. Of course, these are historians. These are uh, people who um, um, court with, um, uh, emperors, uh, empresses, uh, they consider themselves very highly, yet these craftspeople are not their level and they are to be despised, they are to be looked down uh, on. Uh, yet, how did the um, sculptors feel about these people? Or in general, how did they feel about creating art? We don't know anything about that, unfortunately. But by looking at some artworks uh, created by those people, we will um, we'll make an assumption or assertion. Artist or craftsperson? That is my question. So here I, uh, I uh, would like to share with you some photos um, from the life of um, a sculptor. And I was privileged to be uh, with this sculptor. Um, she's my wife. And uh, she comes from a very, very humble uh, background uh, from um, a small village in an obscure um, uh, town in um, southern Turkey. And um, almost illiterate um, parents. Um, yet she decided to study uh, sculpting and then start to produce art. As you see, uh, it's, it's heavy, laborious work. It is not something um, a rich person would endure. You have to work in uh, very uh, difficult conditions. Uh, physical um, strength is important, even though um, she's a tiny woman, um, one meter, 55 centimeters high, uh, with very tiny hands, yet it, it worked. Um, in, in her, it works in her benefit because with tiny uh, fingers, she can um, um, sculpt um, detail much better than a person with larger fingers. So art is in the feeling, in us. It's a kind of gift that we 
the nature uh, bestowed upon us. It is not inherited from another person. It's not inherited from the society. It's not inherited from this and that. It is in you. It comes with you. And it's not important where you come from, uh, from very humble um, origins. We are from very obscure origins. Uh, an incredible artist um, might, um, might arise. So um, art is something that we pursue in our way. And, and when 10 people say that we are a good artist doesn't make us a good artist, or if no one in the world says that we are a good artist, doesn't necessarily mean that we are not a good artist. From very early times, um, artists um, wanted to be known. Um, maybe uh, during the time of uh, big empires, they were unable to uh, position themselves in a way to show that they are uh, a prominent part of the artwork. But uh, from uh, the seventh century, um, we have this uh, statue base and on the base, the uh, artist, um, okay, Carte says, says uh, it speaks actually, uh, it's re really funny and interesting to know. It says, uh, uh, Odicartides made me. This is um, one of the earliest um, signatures um, on a sculptural um, object. Uh, yet, of course, we know that um, there are many um, uh, there are many uh, ceramic uh, objects uh, with uh, a lot of writings on them, uh, including the signature of uh, the artist. One of the earliest examples of um, uh, artist signatures uh, on coins um, come from um, Syracuse um, around 400 BC. Uh, this is an incredible um, decadrum signed by Kimon, uh, his initial is right here. Um, and, and also he didn't uh, think that was enough. So he put another um, signature here uh, spelling out his complete name, Kimon right here. Uh, we need to look at this from a, a political perspective, uh, not, not only from an artistic perspective. Um, whatever happened, uh, that this die engraver was allowed because he was not the one um, uh, financing the uh, striking of this coin. Uh, he was working. He was employed by a certain entity. And yet he was allowed to put his own um, signature on, on this uh, piece of artwork. Uh, so it is 400 BC, it's um, a time, um, it's about uh, the end of the um, uh, somewhat uh, utopic democratic regime introduced by um, Thrasybulos, and, um, and uh, Syracuse is at war with um, Athens, and, and they, uh, they, they need to support uh, their economy, and there is a certain element of freedom in the society that allowed Kimon and quite many other die, coin die engravers in Sicily um, to put their signatures on their works. And here is another one uh, from Camarina, and uh, uh, this is this is obviously the uh, the topic is. Um, uh, about war. Uh, on the uh, obers, we have uh, the head of Hercules with um, lion skin headdress. And uh, uh, right in front of the face, we see Kamari Nayon. And on the reverse, we have um, Athena um, riding or, or driving a, a quadriga. Uh, and uh, Nike is flying to um, uh, uh, bringing a, a wreath. Um, and here is the signature of the um, 
an artist, <laughs> Exa Castidas. So this is, this is a wartime um, coin, yet the artist it was allowed to put his name um, on his work. Um, there are quite many uh, artists uh, operating um, in and around Syracuse and um, other cities uh, on the um, uh, island of Sicily uh, at that time. Uh, another one is Iclea, and, and he put his name right here. And other than their names, actually, we don't know much about these people. And here is another one uh, uh, from uh, Crete, Aptera, fourth uh, century BC. So it's not only uh, the, uh, the, the Syracusan uh, artists or Sicilian artists putting their uh, names, signing their um, uh, um, artwork uh, with their names, but uh, we see that um, in many other places uh, at around the same time. And in this case, it is, um, uh, it's a different um, artist, uh, Pita Toro. Pita Toro is written right here in front. And the ethnicon of the city is in the back, Atarayon. It is larger than the signature of the uh, artist, yet uh, who gave the permission this artist to put his name uh, on a more visible spot. There has to be a certain degree of tolerance and understanding for this person to, um, to display his name on a coin like this, because he's not the one who um, produced the coin. He's just the one who engraved the die. That's, that's all um, his role is. So, what else did he do? There is a, a Stefane ornamented with palmets uh, here. Uh, there's a crescent and solar disc pendant earring with three uh, drops. And there's a pearl necklace. So when we look at it, uh, just like the example that I gave you at the beginning of my talk, uh, we have to, uh, we enjoy it without seeing many details. And it is because the details have been put in such a perfect way, there is nothing to disturb our eyes. We look at it, we like it, and we don't pay attention to detail because in general, it looks perfect. We only pay attention to it when there are imperfections. That is also human nature. Here is another example um, uh, that speaks. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find a better example. This is, uh, again, from the same island, um, Kidonia, city of Kidonia. And uh, we have an artist's uh, name. And the artist says, uh, Noantos made this. Um, apparently, there are examples of this coin with uh, the full uh, legend that I um, typed out here. Uh, but I couldn't find one. Um, yet I could find the nay uh, part. So um, um, I'm sure the, uh, those who um, studied this um, coin uh, with the full legend um, uh, know what they're saying. So, uh, so here the, the uh, artist simply says that uh, he made this and, and this person was given the permission to sign uh, his piece of art like that. Now, um, having this privilege to have uh, an artist in my uh, midst and, um, and she being inspired by my um, uh, interest in ancient uh, numismatics, um, we developed ideas and how as, as, as to how an, a die engraver um, start work. So first of all, uh, you make a sketch of what you want to do, and then um, you create um, a, a pin uh, hole sketch on uh, clay, and then you start um, sculpting, building. Um, and, and her most versatile uh, tool uh, was a plastic toothpick. Without this, she's nothing, I tell you. And um, 
of course, she um, uh, she improved, um, she developed other tools too, but this uh, plastic uh, toothpick is her favorite tool. And you continue building. And finally, um, you um, uh, create your, your artwork. So this is a, a coin from Tarsus from um, uh, the time of Maximinus, uh, Emperor Maximinus. And um, it's the um, judgment of Paris uh, scene, uh, a very beautiful scene, and, and she created this. So I theorize that before engraving uh, a die, um, a coin die artist would sculpt something like this uh, so that he determines uh, the highest and the lowest points that he's going to engrave. So in this case, the knee of the um, of uh, Paris would be the highest uh, point, if not the shoulder of uh, Athena here, uh, while uh, the other uh, parts of the other figures will be lower. So you have to determine your highest and lowest points to, um, to make a proportionate um, scene uh, on, on, the, um, on the die. And she um, decided to sign it right here. It's, um, it's retrogr retrograde. Uh, so um, if you don't pay attention, you would think that it's a kind of ornamentation, but it's actually her signature. So artists have their way of uh, showing themselves on those coins that we don't see. We don't see any um, names doesn't necessarily mean that the artist didn't sign them. Um, and we don't know actually how they um, uh, hit their signature, but there might be um, signatures uh, on many coins. The use of space is, um, was an important consideration at that time, and it is still very important. And um, they're, um, they're, the space that they have to operate on is very limited. And um, for some reason, they decided to make it um, round. So it's, it's a very um, difficult shape to work on. Um, if it were square or, or um, you know, any other um, uh, geometric form, I think it would be easier. But artists uh, in ancient times um, developed certain skills to use the round uh, field uh, in their benefit and created art forms um, based on that. So you have a dotted border uh, to show yourself your limit. So they would, I, I believe they would put the, uh, the border line first uh, so that they know um, their, their limits. And then um, they would have uh, the horses uh, you have a quadriga, four horses, um, chariot. You have uh, a figure um, driving the uh, quadriga, and you have another figure on top of it. So the horses are galloping, and uh, the uh, front legs are upwards. Obviously, the artist is trying to fit um, the scene uh, within the border that he set in the first place. And then there is an empty area here. Uh, that he decided to put a flying knight to fill up that area. And it has to be proportionate to the figure um, below and to the left. And slightly bending posture of the charioteer here also tells us that this person is trying to fit in the scene, actually. Uh, well, um, you might simply say, well, the, uh, the, the uh, the charioteer is actually in the um, race atmosphere and leaning forward. But actually, uh, if you look at it, the artist was trying to fit her in the field that he created. And when we look at the, um, um, the obers, uh, this is the um, reverse, this is the obers, uh, we see the same thing. We have a figure, um, a male uh, figure uh, in the middle, and um, and then we have a crayfish in front of the figure and flying a, a fish with curved back here and another one here. Uh, the straight uh, side of the fish 
is not facing the, uh, the curved area. As you see, the curved part of the fish is facing this area. In both examples, you see that the artist is trying to fit the objects within the space that uh, he allowed himself to operate. And finally, curving legend. Why do we have the legend in this way? Because we have to fill in the space. Again, going back to my discussion um, uh, about the, um, the presentation page, uh, the objects that I uh, decided to display on the space that I, uh, I am allocated to operate must be proportionate and they must fit in such a way that will not strike anyone's um, eye. It will look proportionate, acceptable, without, um, without judgmental eye. And this is a perfect example for the use of uh, space in the most versatile and artistic way, I believe. And this didn't change after um, almost 900 years. Um, here is a coin of Anastasius, uh, 491, 518 uh, AD. Um, and, and you see the same attitude, um, same rules uh, apply. You have to use your space in, in, in the most versatile way. And uh, you cannot be lazy. You have to, you have to be resourceful and hardworking and artistically inspired so that you add more items uh, on the limited space that you have, even though the space is so uh, small. So this is only, look at this, this is only 18 millimeter in diameter. You don't, you're not talking about a 30 millimeter coin. This is just an 18 millimeter uh, I think um, smaller than a, a Canadian five cent um, a coin. And, and also here we have um, low relief with line drawing effect. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that this artist was less skillful than uh, the Sicilian uh, artists of the um, uh, sixth century, fifth century BC. This is the accepted art form of the um, 6th century um, AD or 5th century AD. Uh, you can criticize the way the, um, the face uh, was done. You can criticize the way the, uh, the body was done uh, by just comparing this uh, to the um, Sicilian art, but it would be a mistake. It's a different time. Um, it's, a, it's a different perception and, and, and exceptions um, are different. Um, so look at this. Um, this. This person decided to put a crystogram here. In on many coins, you see crystogram on top of the um, uh, on the top part of the figure or on the lower part of the figure. But the artist here decided to continue the circular legend writing uh, tradition and put the crystogram in such an angle to continue the legend curve. And here we have um, the uh, Nike uh, or Victory uh, um, engraving a kind of shield, um, putting four um, axes, um, wishful thinking that the emperor will um, um, rule, uh, you know, 10 years uh, each axe. The emperor would rule more than 40 years. Uh, which didn't um, turn out to be, uh, but still, um, it's a propaganda piece. And, and, and here, the um, Victor is seated on some kind of a um, stool or chair, ornamented with something else here. And um, it is most likely a, a kind of uh, cross, uh, but um, no one explains what this is. It looks like an eagle. Uh, to my eyes, but I um, checked at least 10 different coins um, and no one explains what this figure here is, but the artist decided to put something here and the border of the chair or the stool that the victory is sitting is dotted. It's not, you know, this person could have simply put a, a line, a curved line, and it could be the end of the thing. 
but the person didn't want to do that. And the same thing is true for the, um, the edge of the shield. The artist decided to make it different. It had to stand out. How did the um, ancient coin die engravers find their topics and how, uh, what inspired them? And if you go uh, really, really um, early times and, and look at the first uh, Lydian electron coin, you see this roaring line. Everybody knows this coin very well. It's, it's, they are very famous. Uh, but you look at the um, examples of art pieces from uh, the same period and even um, earlier periods. You have the same type of roaring line uh, on other um, sculptures and uh, or other um, artistic objects. And depending on the time period, um, they uh, simply uh, employed the same artistic style. Uh, here we have examples of archaic sculpture and um, its reflections. Um, stiff and rich um, appearance similar to that of the Egyptian and Hittite sculpture. They simply employed the same artistic um, style, uh, frontal all eyes. Yet when you um, come to the classical period, uh, you have different artistic styles. As you see here, we have uh, profile eyes introduced um, at this time, um, not, um, not, the, um, not the examples that we saw in uh, the archaic period. Also in this period, the objects or the figures are in the move. Uh, they are not rigid, they are flexible, they are moving, and they are narrative. They explain something. Rather than displaying something, uh, as well as displaying something, there is also a kind of narrative. There is a story uh, that is um, explained on a small coin. And even though um, certain cities or authorities decided to stick with their earlier, uh, the earliest uh, topic when they struck their coins, the stylistic changes are unavoidable over the centuries. So archaic period, 510, 490 BC, uh, Athena tetradrum, and here is a classical period example. And here is an Hellenistic period example. And here is a Roman period example. So you can, there are archaizing um, traditions in ancient um, um, sculpting, uh, as well as in ancient numismatics. Uh, however, the, um, the trends of the period that we live is predominant and it takes precedence over the ancient traditions, no matter how well accepted the ancient tradition uh, may be, the new era's um, trends become uh, predominant and we have to follow, um, follow suit. So far, we, uh, we had uh, different examples of uh, figures, and I wanted to uh, look at female heads and busts um, in time. So early period female head, if it is a female, of course, it's, it looks like a long haired uh, figure and um, doesn't have a mustache or beard. And um, most uh, numismatists would like to identify this uh, head as a woman's head female head. Um, and then we have the classical period, um, Aphrodite of uh, Knidos. And then uh, we see a uh, female head on uh, a classical period coin. Uh, you can see the artistic uh, change in a Hellenistic period figure, Roman Republican. As you see, the artistic style is completely different from one another. 
uh, yes, you can say it's a development of um, artistic rendition, but not really. It is, they're all indigenous uh, for their period. And Roman Imperial, and finally, late Roman. So by looking at a classical period uh, rendition of a female head and all the details, we can marvel, we can love it, we can um, uh, glorify it, but uh, comparing this uh, to this would be a mistake. Uh, we have to evaluate uh, late Roman uh, engraving within the context of the late Roman uh, period trends and traditions. Um, there is religion, there is uh, imperial aspirations. Uh, there are so many other things that are involved in creating a piece of art. From early on, we start seeing um, portraits of um, living creatures, even though in this case, it is a legendary portrait. Um, this is a coin from Macedon, Sicione. Um, the pictured uh, figure is Protesilaus. How do we know it is Protesilaus? Because it is written on it. Very well hidden, but very, very obvious. So Protesilaus was um, a, a mythological figure uh, in um, the Iliad of Homer. Um, here is a coin of uh, Thebai. Um, according to the uh, prophecy, the first to leap ashore the first to die in the Trojan War. Yet, uh, Protesilaus knowingly um, jumped from the ship. And the, the moment that he jumped, you see one foot is on, uh, on, on still uh, prow of the um, galley and the other one is on the waves just before he was to be killed. Look at the, uh, the, the ingenuity of the artist. He is still alive. We know that the moment that he, his foot steps on uh, the shore, he's going to be killed. And that's why one foot, he's still alive, one foot on the pro, the other one foot is on the, um, on the waves. I just cannot help but marvel this um, rendition um, of, of the scene. It is in action, it is a figure in action, uh, the, the whole movement is depicted uh, in a two-dimensional um, space, yet you, you, can, you can see almost he is about to move and, and his movement is about to change. Then um, earliest historical portraits um, start to appear on coins um, as early as um, first part of the uh, 400s, 450, um, you have um, Persian satraps start to um, put their likenesses on um, coins. And together with them, we start seeing examples of mannerism. Um, they decided to depict themselves in such a way that gives us a message. We're not looking at the head of a satrap. We are not looking at the head or face of um, any person. This person has something to say to us. And it is depicted on the expression that we, uh, we see on the coin. When I came across this coin, I felt really um, uh, intrigued, and I immediately recalled the famous uh, Mona Lisa painting, and I put them side by side. Um, again, here is a coin that is um, 20 millimeters uh, only, um, size of um, Canadian five cent, and um, from Thessaly. Um, and, and I'm just going to show you a larger photo of this um, obverse. So as you see, the artist decided to <laughs> depict 
this figure, the head of Hera, uh, from below, creating an awkward look, uh, making uh, a scene that, um, that makes us think that she is gazing into the horizon. It's a godly figure. It's a, uh, it's a goddess that we are uh, talking about here. She's not a normal person. She won't look like a normal person. She's not looking at something, but she's gazing into the horizon. And the artist, in my view, achieved that. We have certain depictions that we call powerful and confident. And I think um, a good example of that is um, Hercules uh, on a tetradrum of Alexander the Great. Um, of course, Hercules is the um, hero, semi-god, uh, and, 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 and as a hero, uh, his achievements are very well known. And um, Alexander, in many ways, um, thought himself as um, Hercules. Um, the discussions uh, continue even today uh, if the depiction that we see on Alexander coins is really Hercules or um, Alexander himself. Yet, what is important for us to look at is the powerful and confident uh, gesture or, 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 or um, pose of the figure um, and depicted. And here, um, we're talking about the same person, uh, uh, Ptolemaic Tetradrum, um, and I call it an expressive uh, image. You see the mouth is open. He is talking. The artist wanted to give us a message. It's not a coincidence that the, uh, the mouth, uh, the lips uh, of this face uh, is left open. They are telling us something. It is lost, unfortunately. And here, the, the mouth is not open. Uh, it is closed, but you see a royal personage uh, depiction, not a regular figure. And again, another one looking up godly impression. Uh, this is deified uh, Alexander on a coin of Lysimachus. Uh, they're all from the same period, um, give or take 10 years maybe, uh, or, or um, less than 10 years. Uh, but the idea here is depicting and glorifying a, an image of a person as a, as a, as almost a, a deity. Hellenistic period um, comes with um, certain qualities in, uh, in art forms. And um, uh, as we saw in the uh, uh, Persian uh, satraps examples, uh, idealized to realistic, the shift uh, is interchangeable, uh, idealism and um, uh, perfectionism and uh, realism. Uh, this is a coin of Ptolemy the first and um, um, a statue of a uh, bust of uh, Ptolemy. You can see the resemblance. And the same is true for um, this uh, coin, uh, Antiochus the third, um, and, and his um, head, marble head, you can see the resemblance. So. Uh, the artist's rendition, uh, renditions in both cases are quite realistic, not really um, idealistic. And the same is true for Cleopatra the Seventh. Um, this is um, a lifetime bust of uh, Cleopatra the Seventh. Uh, this is how we got to uh, know about her many, many years ago. And this is how we see her on her coin. Uh, so the um, Cleopatra, the queen, had no problem with the uh, way she was depicted on this coin. Yet idealization, ideal, idealizing was a, a common, common practice uh, in um, the Hellenistic period. Here we have Cleopatra Thea and Alexander Pallas in the most idealized way. Uh, two uh, royal people can be depicted. And 
um, Septimius Severus and uh, his heir, um, Caesar Caracalla. And now we have uh, the, um, uh, the trio, uh, Crassius the Athletian and Maximianus, all depicted at the same time. And here we have two uh, deities um, on, depicted on uh, a, a small flat. So what I would like to emphasize here is the duality of the objects on uh, the obverse and reverse of a coin. So here we have the Dioscuri, the heads of the Dioscuri, and two people. And on the reverse, we have to have something parallel to that. And the Jugate heads of horses, their horses uh, on the left. And on all these coins, you can see duality uh, of subject um, uh, in some way. Then we have facing hats with complete sense of depth. Uh, the, the highest point, the tip of the nose, and the lowest point, uh, back of the, the hair, uh, are uh, engraved in such a way that is so proportionate that we have no problem when we look at that, but just marvel that. Uh, even on this one, you have um, the head of Hel Helios uh, facing, and before the head is an eagle, and it was engraved in such a way that we know that it is standing in front of uh, um, the, the God's face. An incredible artistic um, exploration. Then you have three quarter facing um, busts. So they continuously challenge themselves. I'm, I'm sure they had nothing to do with other uh, people. It is a sense of force uh, that uh, made the artist to create something different. And uh, facing heads, yes, I can do it, but what if I do a quarter facing uh, head. And here is an, an interesting, uh, beautiful example of that from Larissa in Thessaly. And then you have a looking up um, gesture uh, of the uh, Emperor Constantine. Um, many would like to think that it has something to do with the vision uh, that he saw at the Milvian Bridge to carry the sign of Christ into the battle. Uh, which might be true, uh, but it's always that he's looking up. Then we have Janiform heads um, rendered in such perfection that we look at both of them, we see that they are different. They're not the same figure. So the die engraver didn't use one uh, face to engrave, use two faces, even though the artistic style is the same, uh, the, uh, you can see the differences. They are not the same um, people. They are two different people. And on the um, reverse, we have the head of Athena, yet another different face. So we have three different faces engraved on this coin. And, and I was talking about the duality of the object on the obverse and the reverse. And, and here we have two faces um, um, uh, covering the whole area. On, on here, the artist could have simply engraved the uh, head of Athena in such a position that would not leave any space here. But yet the artist wanted to give another message and uh, Kerikeion was engraved behind the head of um, the, the figure on the reverse. And here is a glorious um, artistic um, work uh, from uh, Tenedos. Um, again, um, in um, the northern part of the Aegean island, um, Aegean Sea, sorry. Um, the Janiform had of a laureate male and diademed uh, female hat, um, generally known as Zeus and uh, Hera, um, his wife. Uh, duality here is uh, reflected in the uh, reverse 
uh, topic, uh, La Beres uh, on the reverse. And the artist, of course, um, was so, uh, uh, so brave and so skillful that uh, he added one, two, three, four, five other elements on this uh, only 32 millimeter uh, diameter uh, space. Uh, art didn't develop in time. Uh, art changed in time. Uh, here is a, a coin from Samaria, uh, modern uh, Palestine, uh, a prisopolic head. Uh, or presopolic hats, three hats. One looking to the left, the other one is to, looking to the right, and one facing. And if that is not enough, on the reverse, you have five discs. There are better examples um, on certain catalogs, but they're uh, black and white, and they don't really look much better than this color photo, but they are Athenian tetradramas uh, with the old reverse. Uh, and on some of them, you can see the oval rivers, um, the oval um, um, figure uh, on, on these coins. And here is a better preserved example from Tarsus, uh, again, uh, um, from about the same time. On the overs is um, um, a, a two-face uh, figure, one male, one uh, female, again, most likely um, Zeus and, and Hera. On the reverse, um, you have uh, the geniform, um, sorry, uh, trisophilic uh, bearded face. When you uh, look at it uh, from right across, you can see here the facing head. Yet, when you focus on the left hand side, you can see how the space is looking to the left. And when you focus to the right hand side, you can see that this is absolutely a uh, right facing head. How he achieved this is incredible. From the same mint, uh, at about the same time, we see um, examples of work with different perceptions and varying levels of skills. Um, here is um, a coin from um, Pinidos in Caria, uh, 500 BC, uh, almost. Um, typical, beautiful, uh, admirable archaic art. Uh, this is dated to uh, a later time, but I believe they uh, are not far apart uh, any more than uh, 10, 15 years, maybe, at the most uh, 20 years. Yet you can see how the same topic was uh, rendered, even though the uh, heads of uh, lions are um, almost, you know, um, perfect. And then um, this is um, dated to about the same time, if not earlier than uh, the rather nicer example. And, and it just tells us that uh, not all artists uh, pursue uh, the same topic the same way, and not all artists um, came with the same, um, um, same skills. Here also, I would like to um, talk about a little bit of the impression. Uh, they, uh, the, the, the impressions here are really to be discussed. Uh, how you can discuss this one, I don't know. Uh, if, if she looks neutral or angry or uh, it does, does the artist want us to think that it's an old lady, I don't know that. And in this one, um, you cannot talk about the expression because the artist had a difficult time to um, to render the, the lips and, and the nose, but yet uh, there is a somewhat smiling um, uh, face. Yet on this one, the artist achieved the, the smile in such a way that we can see the uh, the 
lips, the uh, edge of the lips are going back as we smile and the cheek is protruding uh, here. And you can see the darker area here, how the uh, smile was achieved on this coin. Yet when you look at this one, you see a neutral impression. Uh, the uh, figure, um, Aphrodite, as um, she was um, uh, identifying, uh, is not really smiling, or if there is a kind of smile, it's not as strong as um, on the example that we just saw uh, from Knidos. Uh, yet, the, the area, the use of uh, the, uh, the field is perfect. The uh, proportion of the figure um, uh, is perfect. The proportions of the face and the hair and uh, the even uh, the side figure in the back uh, all give us the sense of perfection and acceptance. And on the reverse, we have a, another roaring uh, lion uh, with the uh, tongue uh, protruding uh, with uh, one of the paws or, or um, trunk uh, paws uh, included in the scene and a flying mare. Uh, so obviously this line is not a, a sculpture. It's an alive um, uh, line and it is out in the, uh, in the wind. It's the artist wanted us that wanted us to think uh, that he is working from a live uh, creature. And again, going back to um, classical idealism and perfection, um, here is uh, another rendition of uh, the um, Knidos um, Aphrodite. And another one. Uh, they're from about the same time period. On this one, you see uh, she has um, uh, tight lips, uh, yet it's, it's not a, um, a, a sculpture. It is a live person. The artist simply tells us that the object uh, that he is depicting uh, on this coin is a live figure. And, and uh, on this one, yet the lips are completely um, different from those of, uh, that we see here. Um, a certain degree of sensuality uh, is uh, intended to give us. And also uh, you can look at uh, these uh, figures from uh, the golden ratio um, perspective. Uh, they are put in uh, such portion that they look to us uh, in, 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 um, in such perfection that we feel good about them. We look at them, we find them normal. We don't find them, ah, uh, you know, we don't say that. We just accept it, or at least I do. And then uh, on this uh, figure, you have the, the, uh, the earring uh, falling directly down. On this one, the figure is out in the, um, in the wind. Um, uh, she is simply by the agency. Uh, she's looking uh, into um, the horizon. Um, beautiful uh, Mediterranean breeze uh, is uh, hitting her face. Her hair is wavy and her earring is wavy. The uh, coins and uh, the uh, depictions of Antiochus IV and Fifanes, um are interesting to uh, look into in terms of artistic um, criticism. Um, here you have um, idealized um, head of the uh, king, and here idealized and expressive head. Again, you see um, some open lips here and yet closed lips here. The king is saying something to us. Now, when we um, 
uh, read uh, Polybius, he gives us some hints about this uh, king. He says, Antiochus Epiphanes, nicknamed from his actions Epimanes, the man-man, would sometimes steal from the court, avoiding his attendants and appear roamingly wildly uh, about in any chance part of the city with one or two companions. His favorite place to be found was the shops of the silversmiths or goldsmiths, chatting and discussing questions of art with the workers in relief and um, other artists. So this, this tells us something about these uh, kings and queens. They, um, they were not simply assigning the job to um, some, um, um, some officials um, to go and um, get some coins designed and uh, struck. They got heavily involved in uh, the way their coins were um, prepared um, and, and, and um, struck. Uh, so this is a, a very good example of that. And also uh, the, the proportions that we see here. Uh, what bothers us, uh, even though we don't say anything about that, is the emptiness in the upper field on both coins. Uh, so even though we think that the artist did a great job here, actually uh, there is one thing that we, our eyes, without any uh, words, disagree with. And also, I would like to uh, talk about this um, uh, palm branch. Uh, you see, the artist uh, didn't know how large the plan would be. So put the uh, palm branch almost next to touching the legend here. So you can see how uneasy the artist felt while creating this reverse um, um, figure. You can see the, the realism is such that you can even see the family lineage um, on coins. Uh, a bold portrait of uh, great strength uh, of Pontus King Mitridates III, his son, Farcanes, and the Farcanes uh, on a smaller coin, and grandson, Mitridates IV, and grandson and uh, the wife, and again, the duality of the overs and rivers uh, figures, and the wife uh, of uh, Mitridates IV. You can see how the family lineage how artistically um, consistent uh, the, the figures are. And, uh, and it wouldn't be a mistake to uh, assert that uh, the, these kings heavily involved in the designing and um, creating uh, the coin dies and made sure that their, um, their likeness is accurate. Then we have realistic and idealistic uh, portraits uh, in the last uh, person uh, of the um, Pontus um, house. Mitchell that he's the, uh, the sixth. Uh, on, on this early example, you see uh, the realistic um, portrait. And on the later period, um, as he gained fame and uh, glory um, uh, during his many, many years, long years of reign, he was depicted in the most idealistic way uh, that we can uh, see on coins. Hair dudes um, are remarkable to uh, study and look at. Um, and, and how um, hairs were uh, ornamented at that time. So they uh, used different um, kinds of um, um, hair holding uh, bands. Ampix is one of them. Usually uh, on the front, we see that. Uh, it's usually made of metal. Um, and here we see wavy hair put in an elaborate knot in the back. 
uh, which was held in place by a net uh, bound by small rings. And the artist made sure the uh, net goes into the hair and, and locks, hair locks are protruding through uh, the, the net. And on the lower part, we see uh, the spantone or part of the uh, net spantone uh, in the back. And on this one, we only see the ampix uh, with the um, artist's signature on here. And see, the hair was combed mostly and tucked into the ampix uh, in such a way, in such perfect way, that we, we see no imperfections. Uh, we simply accept it as, as is. Um, smaller, um, shorter uh, hair, as we all have, uh, is going down, but in such an artistic way, too. And after, uh, this is about the same time, this is a bronze coin, and uh, we see the Ampix and Spandone uh, in, uh, in the same way, but uh, the Spandone in this case is made of cloth, most likely, uh, if not silver uh, or gold or any other um, light um, precious metal uh, covering the whole hat, yet the hair is coming under the Ampix, going over, and tucked into uh, the spantone part. And also the way the hair is coming from the top of the head uh, was rendered in such a way that we, um, we find perfect. Um, the same uh, hairdo can be seen um, on, a, um, uh, on a Roman coin um, from uh, how many years? Uh, 300 years after the, uh, the examples that I have just shown. And um, so the, the, uh, the artistic style changed, uh, yet the way women uh, wore their headdresses um, didn't. I have to um, give it to, um, to the idea. You had skillful artists and not so skillful artists. And, um, you know, not all people um, were created the same and um, the gift is not the same, uh, yet they all worked. I have a presentation uh, that I um, entitled uh, 1001 Faces of the Emperor. I um, uh, studied the coins of Caracalla and um, I had um, given that presentation a couple of years ago and maybe we should revisit it. It's, it's really fun to see how uh, the same emperor uh, was depicted um, on his coinage from uh, different parts of his realm. Transparent drapery, you would, uh, you would think um, is hard to achieve on, um, um, on a marble uh, statue. And this is a very early example of that uh, from the um, Acropolis of Athens, uh, from the temple of Athena, uh, Nike, Nike adjusting her sandal. And transparent drapery uh, was rendered uh, on a Himera coin from Sicily. Um, you have Nike again advancing, holding uh, a wreath, open wreath, uh, six pallets here, but you can see how the uh, drapery was created uh, in the most transparent way. And at about the same time, uh, a coin from Kaunas showing another um, Nike uh, or sometimes uh, identified as Iris, um, the same uh, transparent um, rendition. And um, another coin from, again, the fifth century, uh, late fifth century uh, from Malos, um, a winged deity uh, wearing a kind of um, short uh, ketone uh, and transparency was managed. From the same period, from the same city, um, you can say that this is a different rendition, but I would say, yeah, not all artists um, had the same uh, skills.
public art on coins. We just talked about this one, uh, Demetrios uh, Poriarchetes, and we saw how this was um, created uh, from marble, or actually, um, I would suspect the marble um, statue uh, would inspire the, um, the artist of this coin. Um, Tiche of Antioch was depicted on many coins. Interestingly, it was first introduced apparent, apparently um, during the time of um, Seleucus I. So uh, it must have been ordered and introduced uh, during um, uh, early 300s or, um, uh, or late 300s or uh, early uh, 290s. Uh, yet, it doesn't appear on coins until uh, the first century BC. Uh, so Pliny the Elder uh, tells us about this. Uh, Otokides represented the river Orantes here. Of this figure, it has often been said that art has made it more liquid than the river itself. So they uh, thought uh, this statue very, very highly. And here is an example from the Vatican Museum of the statue. We have um, other statue represented on uh, coins. Here, um, the statues of Augustus and uh, Claudius on a coin uh, of Philippi in Macedon uh, from the time of Claudius, uh, 4154 um, AD. Um, you have the bare head of the emperor, and on the reverse, uh, we have a statue group, two statues on a pedestal. There are three pedestals here, bases, one inscribed, uh, yet uh, you have um, Augustus being crowned by Deus Julius Caesar uh, on this coin. And it is, um, it is quite possible that there um, was a uh, statue uh, group um, in the city. And we have also um, strong reasons to believe that there was um, a lizard slayer statue at some point um, in Nicopolis at Istrum um, in uh, Moesia Imperium, as uh, it is shown on this coin. And, and again, uh, we are talking about a 20 millimeter uh, space, a very limited space. Uh, um, engraving a, a nude uh, male figure uh, would not be a big problem. And engraving um, a tree trunk would not be a problem either, but engraving a tiny, tiny lizard, uh, just I say hats off. Uh, to this um, uh, coin die engraver. And we learn about this from, again, uh, the Pliny the Elder. Uh, it says, Praxiteles, also, uh, though more successful and consequently better known as a worker in marble, created at marble works in bronze. He made a young Apollo with an arrow watching a lizard as it creeps up with intent to slay it um, close uh, at hand. This is known as Soroctonos or lizard slayer. Many years after uh, the work of Praxiteles, um, we see the, um, the type uh, represented on a coin. Praxiteles, of course, was known um, much um, before uh, with his um, famous uh, nude Aphrodite um, sculpture. And um, interestingly, on the coins of uh, Knidos, uh, we only see the head of Aphrodite. We don't see the full figure uh, until the Roman period. Uh, we uh, don't see the full figure. Uh, if the um, statues survived, most likely the statues survived during the time of Caracalla. And here is um, the um, typical uh, figure of Aphrodite um, holding um, some kind of a, a, a dress in her hand um, and in, in slight move, um, 
standing on the right uh, leg, uh, left knee bent um, somewhat, and you see the same movement on this corner. Other um, sculptural items uh, represented on coins. Uh, here is a coin from uh, Prusias uh, in Bithynia, uh, crouching um, Aphrodite, um, bathing uh, and um, tending uh, to her hair. Um, sometimes um, she is depicted with a cupid uh, behind her, actually. In this one, even though we don't see the cupid, she's looking uh, backward. Uh, to see uh, the naughty Cupid uh, approaching her. And the same movement, the same gesture is depicted on this uh, bronze coin, only 23 millimeters in diameter. This coin was, um, 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 my friend Paul uh, drew my attention to this coin many years ago, maybe 15 years ago when I first came to, um, to Vancouver he showed me this coin uh, and, and, and immediately um, I uh, fell in love with that. And the, the story uh, behind it is uh, so interesting. Um, it is apparently uh, inspired uh, from a painting of Nicomachus, um, Roman period, um, Republican um, period um, painter, artist. Uh, Pliny says the brother of uh, Plautius Plancus, Manutius Plancus had dedicated in the capital a painting by the famed Nicomachus. So the monier is simply advertising his family's uh, gift to the capital uh, on this coin. So on the obverse, you have a um, head of Medusa facing, and on the reverse, Victory facing, holding palm branch in her hand and leading uh, a quadriga, four horses. Um, galloping, actually, they're all flying. And we have monuments uh, represented on coins. Um, Castor and Pollux, the Dioscuri uh, in Rome, um, as you see here, and they are depicted on a, a big uh, medallion of uh, Commodus. Uh, you have the same figure uh, with the addition of Jupiter in the middle holding um, uh, his, his famous um, weapon uh, and uh, his attribute, uh, an eagle um, on, the, on the base. Now, was this coin created as a currency or as um, a piece of art? It is open to discussion. Uh, the, uh, the simplicity, yet perfection, uh, was uh, both of them were put into consideration uh, while designing uh, the obverse and reverse figures of this coin. Uh, Augustus uh, was, well, Octavian, I should say, uh, was proclaimed Augustus. Uh, he is the uh, perfection um, represented in human figure. And it has to be advertised on the mass media. What is the mass media uh, medium? Coins. And on the obverse, we have his um, uh, head from slightly behind. Uh, so uh, we can uh, we can slightly see his eye and uh, the uh, edge of his mouth and the nose, but we can see mostly the uh, back of his head and neck. And the only uh, definition that he uh, needs here is that he is Caesar. On the reverse is a hyphen. You can think why, um, but when you um, read ancient historians, um, storytellers, you uh, find out why. After Actium, he requisitioned from Athens four massive statues of cattle created by the sculptor Myron in the fifth century BC to decorate an altar within his temple of Apollo on the Palatine. So 
the heifer that we see here is actually a, a sculptural work that he um, he brought from Athens. And these statues, um, I don't know if he uh, brought all four of them or just one, uh, are depicted on the coins of um, Vespasianus too. So the sculptures must have survived um, Augustus. We see that coins were incorporated into jewelry uh, from early on. Um, and, and I have some examples from the Roman period. And interestingly, I found examples uh, from the same uh, dynasty, from the same uh, family lineage. Uh, first, Julia Domna, and then Severus Alexander, uh, when he was um, uh, a teenage boy, and then uh, when he was in his 20s. Um, the artistic uh, rendition of the pendants are, are the same. So they must have been uh, created at about the same time, um, but um, it's unsure when they were created. The, the artistry of the, um, uh, the frames uh, look uh, Roman, ancient. So I don't think they are modern. Um, so I would assume that they are from the uh, third century AD. And the same thing uh, is seen um, in, in later periods. Uh, here is an interesting example um, from the Boden Museum in Berlin. Um, a medallion of Honorius was set into a larger medallion uh, with a um, golden chain. Then we have this extraordinary object, um, a ball, a fiale, um, Roman gold coins, a ray, uh, were used to decorate the, uh, the rim uh, of it. And um, on the top, we see um, Hadrian. And then um, uh, we have um, Antoninus Pius. We have uh, Marcus Aurelius, Antoninus Pius. We have Marcus Aurelius, young Marcus Aurelius. And then we have old Marcus Aurelius and their wives, Faustinas, younger um, and, and uh, older Faustinas. And then we have Septimius Severus and, and, and Caracalla. So this um, must have been created after uh, the time of uh, Caracalla or during the time of uh, Caracalla. Uh, so 210, 211 um, forward. Um, Unfortunately, there is not much information about this uh, ball, uh, other than uh, it's being uh, an extraordinary example of uh, ancient coins uh, used as decorations uh, for a ball. And when you uh, look at the, uh, the middle, middle uh, figure, uh, Dionysus and Hercules uh, are feasting. Uh, they're enjoying uh, a party with all the known figures behind them um, joining the party. Uh, towards the end, my, uh, end of my talk, I um, would like to share this extraordinary piece um, that is um, supposedly the first example of a coin struck by a professional um, art guild, uh, the artists of Dionysus uh, from the second century BC. Uh, on the obverse is the, um, the head of Dionysus with his um, traditional ivy wreath. And on the reverse is a theosos, uh, the uh, uh, staff of um, uh, Dionysus. And the legend simply uh, tells us about this um, these Dionysiac um, artists. Um, so they, they were based in the city of Theos um, around 207, 206, and they enjoyed a tax-free land grant from the city. When Theos passed under a Talid control um, after 188, the group at the Pergamene court called the artisan, artists of Dionysus 
Katagemon merged with the uh, Tian group to form the Association of Dionysiac Artists in Ionia and the Hellespont and of Dionysius Katagemon. This is the group that issued this unique uh, tetradrum here. Um, artistically, um, it's, it's of course perfection um, that we can see. Uh, however, how an artisan uh, group uh, achieved the financial means to strike a coin is incredible. And finally, I would like to talk about um, some uh, unbelievable uh, rendition of artful um, look at things, optical trickery. Uh, on the left hand side, you are you have um, a head of a woman facing to the right, and here you have a woman facing to the left. Yet it is on a coin like this. Two faces are on top of one another, overlapping faces. Now, uh, look at the size of this coin. It's only six millimeter. We're not talking about 20 millimeters. We're not talking about 30 millimeters. We're talking about a tiny um, uh, bit size uh, coin. Yet the artist had the vision, had the skills, had the impetus to create something like this. And it's not the only example. Here is another one from uh, Michelena. Uh, oh, by the way, this one is from um, Cilicia, uh, Uncertain Mint, but most, of, most likely Tarsus. And this one is from Michelena uh, on the Lesbos Island. Uh, this, is, uh, this one is um, a, a silver um, uh, coin. And this one is an Electrum coin. I um, uh, intentionally uh, turned this to black and white. Um, I believe uh, you can appreciate the, uh, the figures uh, better in black and white. And uh, again, I photoshopped and uh, cleaned the, um, uh, the left and left hand side and uh, right hand side figures for you to see how the artist achieved this uh, trickery. Uh, on, on this very, very small flint. This one is much larger than the other one, of course. That one is six millimeters. This one is nine millimeters. Uh, I'm sure you know I'm being sarcastic here. Uh, and, and here is um, a color photo of uh, another coin uh, by the same artist, most likely, and how it was achieved um, on a small flint like this. As usual, I have some um, recommendations for further reading. Um, I benefited greatly from uh, this book, Craftsman in uh, Greek and uh, Roman Study by Alison uh, Burford. It's an old book from 1970s, early 1970s, but um, very, very uh, well written. I would definitely recommend that you look into that. And Numismatic Art of the Greek World um, by Wayne Salis is an, a, a, an excellent handbook um, to uh, look into um, um, art history. Uh, Wayne himself is, was educated as an art historian. So, um, and then being a numismatist, uh, he combined um, his education with his uh, extraordinary um, numismatic um, uh, information and created this nice book. Um, Sutherland's Art in Coinage is another um, old book, but um, very, very nice, uh, worth um, taking a look uh, at if you can find it. And also the, um, this one is even more difficult to find, I believe, but um, it can be in certain libraries. Ancient coins illustrating lost masterpieces of Greek art and numismatic commentary on Pausanias is, a, is an excellent book to uh, look into. Thank you. And I would be happy to um, answer if you have any questions. <laughs>